தமிழரின் பிம்பம் உங்கள் டிவி Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Crossroads on TVI. We are here today at the Albany Club, the very historic Albany Club actually, for a session that CHRV, the Canadian Human Rights Voice is holding and the focus is really power politics and muted voices. We'll be speaking to some of the attendees here today about a couple of things, the Commonwealth uh, meeting that is happening in Sri Lanka in November and their opinion on that and human rights, the state of human rights in Sri Lanka. I just also wanted to point out a, an interesting th th thing that our team is very impressed about. Behind me here is a letter by Sir John A. MacDonald um, that is, was found in the archives of uh, John Diefenbaker, so two Prime Ministers of Canada. Again, speaks to the history of the location that we're in, the Albany Club. So stay with us. We'll be back in a few minutes with interviews from people in attendance here. You're watching Crossroads on TVI. Welcome to Crossroads on TVI, a show that showcases the Tamil Canadian community, their issues and their successes. I'm your host, Manjula Salvaraja. On our show today, we will speak to various guests about the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting that is happening in Sri Lanka in November. And uh, so far, there's been quite a bit that Canada has said about boycotting this, at least the Prime Minister has, but Canada is still sending a delegation. So the questions that we're asking is, does it matter that Sri Lanka is holding this? Should attending countries push for a change of location? What effect could such a change or a boycott really have? We will discuss this and more. But first, please take a look at this clip of our interview with Jeevan Mano, Human Rights Team Lead for Canadian Human Rights Voice at that forum that we just attended. Uh, today, we're just reaching out to our supporters and our uh, backers and we also want to basically uh, deliver on what uh, we promised to do which is to you know show what we've accomplished to this day and as you know uh, Sri Lanka is uh, holding um, uh, the Commonwealth meeting so we hope that we can use this event today to get our backers to help us go to the next level of lobbying our leaders in this country to prevent uh, that meeting from taking place in Sri Lanka because we feel that Sri Lanka doesn't deserve to uh, hold such prestigious event when they haven't improved um, the situation of the Sri Lankan Tamils since the end of the war in 2009. Let's meet our guests. Fred Carver, who will be joining us on the phone a bit later, is the campaign director of the Sri Lanka Campaign for Peace and Justice, a multi-ethnic, non-partisan group who campaigns for a just and lasting peace in Sri Lanka based upon accountability and respect for human rights. He will join us on Skype again later. Todd Ross is the media spokesperson and director of Canadian Human Rights Voice, a group who is committed through political diplomacy to the betterment of life for millions of civilians around the world suffering under human rights violations. He's in the studio with us today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's always a pleasure. So, you know, I know that um, a lot of people are hearing about this Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Perhaps you can tell us just a little bit for our audience that's not familiar with it, a little bit about the meeting itself. Sure, absolutely. Every, every uh, couple of years, the Commonwealth Heads of Government uh, get together and they have um, a number of issues that, that are addressed at the meeting. Um, and there's a rotation of the chair. Uh, so one country always becomes the chair of the Commonwealth for a period of two years. So traditionally, it's the country that hosts the meeting that they become the, the figurehead chair of the, uh, of the Commonwealth group for the next two years. So as we talk about the Commonwealth meeting being held in November in Sri Lanka, not only is the meeting going to be held there, but they will also become the chair of the Commonwealth for a period of two years. And that's raised a lot of concern with, uh, with people around the world. So, and you know, it's interesting because uh, I, th I don't think that aspect, for people who even know the meeting is happening, I don't think the fact that Sri Lanka could get to chair the Commonwealth is something that people really know, people who are even sort of well-versed on the issue. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a larger question, because I know that you've done all sorts of activism, you're politically active as well. Um, what is really the relevance of the Commonwealth? 
uh, today? Well, there's, there's been a lot of questions on whether or not the, the Commonwealth is relevant. Uh, I mean, there's even questions on whether or not the United Nations is, is relevant in today. Uh, and because we have, uh, you know, globally, there, you know, there is so much happening in nations around the world. And, and I would say collectively, our attention span is not that great uh, uh, in, in modern society. So people are questioning the relevance of organizations like the United Nations and the mm -hmm. Commonwealth and what are they actually achieving and, and is the mandate of the Commonwealth today uh, of the same relevance as it was when it was created. Um, we also have, you know, you have to recognize that the Commonwealth uh, is, is historically, um, it is the nations that were under the rule of Great Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, so the queen uh, and uh, uh, through her role as the monarchy is involved. So when we talk about the Commonwealth nations and the Commonwealth meeting, um, we also have to remember that there's a reputational impact to the queen as the head of state uh, of the Commonwealth. So every time, uh, if there becomes an embarrassment to the Commonwealth, we're really talking about an embarrassment to the queen uh, and certain countries will see that as as more of a threat than other countries certainly great britain is uh is a nation that uh takes the um the reputation of the queen very seriously so we'll be very concerned around the the image of the commonwealth and how that will affect her you know that's interesting because i actually had a a, a an article that i uh, read that was written by sir ronald sanders uh he's a senior a Caribbean diplomat, and he was part of an eminent persons group that was called on to help reform the Commonwealth. I believe it was a few years ago. Now he's written that Sri Lanka's hosting and leading the Commonwealth will actually serve to discredit the Commonwealth itself, which is, you yes. know, echoing what you've said. So let's look at the reverse of that. What is the impact that hosting the Commonwealth does for Sri Lanka? Well, of course, it's huge prestige for uh, uh, for Sri Lanka, but it's also it's um, it's it's becomes a, a almost a medal of Sri Lanka is not doing anything wrong uh, in the eyes of the Commonwealth that the Commonwealth has said that yes you can be our chair for two years uh, so it further arguments uh, uh, or it further provides ammunition for the for the president and for the government that Sri Lanka is on the right path that the steps that uh, minor that they are, the steps that they've taken in the reconciliation uh, in the international community are fine. And that is the message that they'll be sending back to the people in Sri Lanka who are paying attention is that, see, we're holding the Commonwealth. The world community sees that that our regime is, is wonderful and everything that we're doing is great. Uh, so for Sri Lanka as a nation domestically, it's mm. a huge bonus, but also internationally and in that they can now claim that uh, that they've that the Commonwealth has given them this rubber stamp to go ahead as the chair uh, and they will use this on the international forum to say we are in the right and everything that we're doing is is okay. Todd, what kind of precedence is there? I mean there has been some in the past for the Commonwealth acting. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to us about that? Well I, the Commonwealth has evolved. The uh, just recently I believe it was in, in uh, March that the Commonwealth has come out with a new a new um, uh, or an updated uh, human, rank, uh, human rights as, as well as other, um, other uh, conditions that they consider as a priority. If you go back 20, 30 years, I guess it was, uh, there was going to be a Commonwealth meeting held in New Zealand. Uh, at that time, uh, apartheid was strong in South Africa. There was an international ban on, uh, on participation in sports events, and New Zealand uh, ignored that ban and, and participated in some sports events uh, with South Africa. The Commonwealth, 30 years ago, acted and cancelled the meeting in, in New Zealand. Just for that. Just for that. And that was okay. And, and you know, it, it speaks, of course, to the, to the apartheid um, and the seriousness of that, but certainly when you, when you compare what has happened in Sri Lanka uh, and the, the steps that the Commonwealth now seems to be ignoring that are, that are uh, to their, um, uh, that those are tools that they have to use, it causes the question is, have, has the Commonwealth softened uh, in that they're planning to, to ignore what Sri Lanka has done, um, especially given these new, uh, these new rules that, that the Commonwealth has just endorsed, the Queen actually signed her name to it. Um, so is this all sort of, are they just using words and not, not planning on following up with actions is the, is the concern. So what kind of advocacy work is your organization doing around 
um, of, just so we don't keep saying Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, right. we're going to say Chogam. So what is the kind of advocacy work your organization is doing? So we, uh, CHRV started 2009. We've been doing a lot of work in building those relationships with Canadian politicians of all stripes. Uh, so uh, we maintain you know, very, very close relationships with the four political parties, with, uh, with the Conservatives, the Liberals, the New Democrats, and the Bloc. Um, the, in our ongoing sessions, we, we regularly meet with, uh, with MPs and, and speak to them around the concerns. In, uh, uh, I guess it was about 18 months ago, the Prime Minister announced that, that he would not be attending the Commonwealth in person. Although he didn't directly consult us on that, we were certainly thrilled uh, and, and think that in some small part that through our ongoing conversation that, uh, that they were paying attention and, and that he came to this decision. Most recently we've seen uh, uh, Bob Ray, the outgoing leader uh, of the Liberals, also came out with a very strong statement saying Canada should not participate in the Commonwealth. Uh, and, and I think it's through those close relationships that we're seeing that the parties are, are looking beyond sort of a, a partisan issue or a partisan gain in this and saying what is the right thing to do and, and we're very happy to have had some small role uh, in that. In that. Well that's, I mean that, I remember when I heard uh, about Stephen Harper's stance, I mean at that point no one else had actually said anything similar. It's definitely a very, seen as a bold stand at least by the by the community. So I, I'm, I understand that Fred Carver is on the line with us now. Fred, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, I can, and uh, great to join you. So okay. Thank you for the call. Wonderful. Um, and I know that sometimes we have troubles with Skype, but it's always a pleasure to, to do what we can to get guests like um, Fred on. So we've just been speaking with uh, Todd Ross about the uh, CHOGAM, the, Con uh, the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. And uh, perhaps I'll, uh, I'll ask you the same question, Fred. What kind of advocacy work is your organization doing around CHOGAM? Um, I mean, we see Chogham as being a real problem, frankly. I think there's a real danger that the um, good work which uh, various different organizations have put in over the last uh, three, four years to really draw attention to what's um, going on in Sri Lanka, a kind of crisis of human rights in Sri Lanka, uh, could really be undone uh, in quite a damaging way. Um, if this Commonwealth Summit is what the President of Sri Lanka hopes it will be, which is an enormous political jamboree uh, in which all the kind of uh, transgressions of um, uh, the government of Sri Lanka are swept under the carpet. And it's kind of an opportunity for the government of Sri Lanka to press the reset button on the way they're seen uh, by the international community. Uh, and if that happens, then that really would be very, very damaging um, for Sri Lanka and for Sri Lankans. Uh, so we're very, very keen to stop that from happening. Um, so we're doing various kinds of things with awareness raising. We've done uh, four um, uh, infographics, which are up on our website. We also have a petition running uh, and various different um, advocacy tools, which we're using to basically get the message out that Sri Lanka is going through a human rights catastrophe. And if this Commonwealth Summit is used as, as a whitewashing tool, then, then that will be a hugely uh, retrograde step. So then let me come uh, talk about this meeting that's coming up because the, uh, the reason we decided to have this show uh, today as opposed to a little bit closer is because there is a meeting that's happening on April the 26th. Uh, Fred, could you tell us about that meeting? And again, it's a Commonwealth, uh, a Commonwealth meeting. Yes, I mean, it's a meeting, um, the Commonwealth loves its acronyms, this one's CMAG, which stands for Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group, uh, and it's a collection of um, five or six um, member states of Commonwealth nations, including Canada, they're on the, uh, they're on the CMAG at the moment, and they need to discuss issues of uh, importance to the Commonwealth, and in particular, they need to discuss and enforce uh, serious situations that are arising in Commonwealth nations where Commonwealth nations uh, are violating uh, Commonwealth principles. Now, very, very clearly, Sri Lanka falls under that uh, remit, and very, very clearly, CMAG therefore should discuss Sri Lanka. Uh, but it's not an automatic process. It's decided in part by the, um, the president of CMAG, which is Bangladesh, and it's decided in part by the Commonwealth Secretariat, which is a man, uh, an Indian diplomat called Kamala Sharma. And neither of those have yet been willing to say that the situation in Sri Lanka is serious enough uh, 
uh, to one that's being discussed on, on April 23rd. So although it seems obvious to us that it should be discussed, it actually requires, um, you know, people to take action to put Sri Lanka on that CMAC agenda. Uh, and that hasn't yet happened. Uh, but all hope is not lost because any Commonwealth member state can raise Sri Lanka um, onto that agenda. And one would think at very least, given the start Stephen Harper has taken, that Canada would. Um, and, and so one would hope, um, and it's ridiculous that this is even something we have to discuss, but one would hope that on April 23rd, um, Sri Lanka will be discussed by the you know, very powerful committee, which has the power to enforce all sorts of sanctions against Sri Lanka. Now, whether they will or not um, remains to be seen, unfortunately. So let me, I mean, the, we were talking before about the kind of precedence um, that has been around with regards to the Commonwealth taking action. Oh. And, um, and, and you were not online by then, but, you know, Todd was speaking about New Zealand and South Africa and how, because I believe, you know, um, New Zealand had, went, had uh, been involved in an event with South Africa, the Commonwealth took oh. action against them. And that was 30 years ago. This is for something much larger. Why, why the hesitation on, on, by the Commonwealth? Why is there not more happening? And I put this to you because you're located in the UK and I'm curious to hear uh, you know, the opinion of someone who works in advocacy out there in the UK. Um, I mean, I completely agree. I mean, it's frankly pathetic. Uh, and it's also really, really depressing that you know, the Commonwealth has this glorious um, history of uh, being at the forefront of the fight against apartheid and has been a really progressive uh, model um, for how countries which share values which are still with democracy and human rights can stand together um, and hold their, 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 their peers to, to account when it comes to democracy and human rights. And they, uh, you know, the Commonwealth is absolutely at forefront of the war against apartheid. Uh, the Commonwealth in the past took incredibly strong action against Nigeria and Pakistan for the kinds of human rights violations um, that Sri Lanka are getting away with. Now, why is Sri Lanka being held to such a lower standard compared to all these other countries? Um, and I think the answer to that is very sad, is that the Commonwealth is meant to be a community of shared values, but what it's increasingly becoming is, is a trading network. Uh, and increasingly, Commonwealth members seem to be in it uh, for the opportunities to trade and not for the values that, that the Commonwealth meant to embody. Um, but this is really, really short term and really dangerous because the reason the Commonwealth works as a trading community is because it's a brand you can trust. Uh, and that brand has no value if, frankly, um, the, the, the standards for membership of the Commonwealth are so low that no matter how many Commonwealth values you introduce, you continue to have no sanction uh, passed against you. Um, so uh, that's a rather depressing answer to your question, but I'm afraid I think the answer is that the Commonwealth is showing itself to lack morals at the moment. Interesting. So, you know, I'll, I'll ask you, Todd, because I was actually curious about this. When it comes to the Commonwealth, do you think there are certain countries that actually wield a little bit more a power or influence than others? Well, certainly the, the current members on the Ministerial Action Group uh, have a certain amount of power in, in, uh, in relation to the upcoming meeting in November. Uh, I would, you know, obviously Great Britain uh, has has the most influence of any of the Commonwealth nations, just with their association with the Queen, um, and and I think Canada, Australia, New Zealand. I think that they also hold uh, a fair bit of power just by the size of their economies. Um, so if if Canada has already said that the Prime Minister won't attend, if we do have Australia uh, and if if Great Britain and if you know, and then if we have countries like India and even Jamaica are talking about the possibility of, of uh, not attending, um, I think what it takes is a small group to now say that we will not participate if the meeting is held in Sri Lanka. Uh, and I think that uh, that will force the Commonwealth, uh, the Secretary General, to, uh, to move the meeting. Uh, but right now it's, it's you know, Canada is on its own. Uh, although we've had several um, politicians from around different countries calling, uh, usually opposition members who are calling for the for the boycott of, of this particular uh, that's happening meeting. in the UK. Yeah, in the UK. In, yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, you know there there is some hope that if we can get a few more members to uh, to sign on to say we will not participate, that that will force it. The we mentioned the April meeting with the ministerial action group and. 
Minister Baird is is uh, planning to attend that, I understand, and, and has a seat on there. Minister Baird has also been very strong in, in echoing the Prime Minister's commitment uh, that the Prime Minister will not attend. So my hope is that, that he will continue that message. Um, if it's, uh, uh, and I, I believe the Secretary General spokesperson is, has confirmed that right now the location of, of Sri Lanka is not on the agenda. However, and, and Fred, you will speak to this as well, is that there are several uh, informal conversations that will happen at the April meeting, which I think mm. would also provide an opportunity to further pressure the Secretary General uh, into, uh, into uh, changing the venue in, in Sri Lanka as the, uh, as the chair. Great. So you know what? We're going to take a bit of a break now. Both of you are going to stay with us because we have a lot more discussion on this coming. You're watching Crossroads on TVI with Manjula Salvaraja. Welcome back to Crossroads on TVI. We're speaking to Fred Carver of the Sri Lanka Campaign for Peace and Justice and Todd Ross of Canadian Human Rights Voice about the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Before we uh, start that conversation, please take a look at this clip of our interview with Chuck Conkle, creator of Canada's hate crime, hate crime program and CHRV director. The dynamics we have to realize with the, the uh, Commonwealth Minister's meeting is that the Prime Minister has been very adamant that he is not attending. And I think that is a fact. I think there are many layers to this formula that we have to be cognizant of. One is that we will we'll probably end up sending somebody. Um, that's an option. Another option is Mauritius. There are several negotiations going. Uh, ongoing right now. I've heard Mauritius is an off-site. I've heard that we may be sending people. I've heard we, we may downgrade the delegation. Um, it, we should be aware that we are the second largest contributor to the Commonwealth. And to put things in perspective, not to have a seat at the table is to allow those people who will be less than ethical in their behavior and who have been less than ethical in their human rights behavior to run the show and spend our money. So there, there has to be some awareness that the saying no comes with a price and that price may be to absent the voice that we have to have. Um, conversely, what we also have to realize when we look at the Commonwealth meeting is that, that um, the Prime Minister has been the first and foremost proponent of uh, being absent. He has been the first spokesman, the most vocal spokesman. He's gone far further than any other leader in the Commonwealth. And a lot of these uh, uh, very forthright positions he's taken and honorable positions he's taken have not been uh, balanced by, by the, the positions of other leaders of, of, of first world democracies. It does no uh, good for um, the first world Commonwealth to say we're not going and to allow the second and third world commonwealth to say I told you so. A lot of this is, is engaging members of the second and third world commonwealth, new, newly emerging nations and, and even uh, signatories to the 1947, 48, 49 commonwealth documents that Sri Lanka was also signatory to, to have them be aware that they are also responsible for ethical conduct. So Fred, uh, further to what uh, Todd was saying before we um, left for the break during the segment, I just wanted to read you uh, something that uh, Francis Harrison, uh, the writer of Still Counting the Dead, had written an article in the Huffington Post. She says, the Commonwealth Secretary General Kamala Sharma himself said in mid-January this year that Sri Lanka's impeachment could be perceived Impeachment, of course, uh, we are talking about the, uh, of the judiciary, of the uh, Sri Lanka's chief justice that happened recently, that Sri Lanka's impeachment could be perceived to constitute violations of core Commonwealth values and principles. Yes, it is definitely interesting that there are going to be these informal discussions, but why is it that given these guidelines that Sri Lanka is not on the agenda on the April 26th meeting? Um, it honestly makes no sense whatsoever. Um, the reason is because uh, Kamala Sharma um, has not put it on the agenda of the April 26th meeting and because the uh, CMAG member states 
uh, have not been able to reach a consensus that it should be on the, the, the April 26th meeting. Now, the reason for that is they're hiding behind procedure, but um, as Francis Housing goes on to talk about in that article, and as we ourselves have said in letters to the Secretary General, uh, they're hiding behind procedure. Their reading of the procedure is wrong. According to the procedure, this should be discussed. It must be discussed. I mean, it's it's obvious. You have a, a country which is in clear violation of core Commonwealth values. We're not talking about, you know, failing to cross the seas and dot the I's. We're talking about, you know, trampling over the rule of law, the most serious human rights violations there are. It's, it's obvious that it should be discussed at CMAG. Um, and that's not just a position of morality, that's also a position of, um, of um, the, the pragmatics of what's required according to the procedures. Um, but for whatever reason, Kamala Sharma is clearly unwilling. Uh, he made that very clear when he came back from Sri Lanka and made a, a very poor speech uh, upon leaving Sri Lanka, where he clearly uh, had put his fingers in his ears and covered his eyes uh, during his trip to Sri Lanka. Um, and it's also clear that... Um, Commonwealth member states are not willing to show the same degree of leadership and commitment that, uh, that Canada has thus far. Um, so that's the reason it's not being discussed. But as, um, as, as, as my colleague said, um, it, there, there's discussion and there's discussion, and just because it's not on the formal agenda does not mean that it will not come up. I mean, it cannot not come up. Uh, and in addition, there is still time, and, uh, and you know, it is not yet April 26, and in the next three weeks we'll be doing our hardest to make sure it does. Um, come up on the uh, on the CMAG agenda in as formal a way as it can. Interesting. And, you know, he's brought up Canada's stance. Mm -hmm. So perhaps you can share well, with us um, Canada's stance when it comes to attending the, the Commonwealth, the Chogam. Right. So, uh, I, um, I mean, they haven't been drawn on whether they will send anybody. Um, Stephen Harper has said that uh, he will not attend unless the human rights situation shows improvement. Now, I'm afraid there is virtually no chance of that. Um, the, the, the human rights situation in Sri Lanka is almost certainly not going to improve between now and November. I would love it if it did, but it won't. Um, now, they haven't said... So, so I think it, it can be pretty much taken that, that Stephen Harper will not attend, or if he does attend, that will require a major U-turn on his part. And I don't think um, anyone in, in, in Canada or elsewhere would let him get away with, with, with such a U-turn, although um, apparently it has happened before. Um, so um, now, whether they'll send other people or not, they have yet to decide. Uh, we run a petition saying that there should be... A, uh, that Canada needs to follow through with, with um, its, its commitment to sending a strong stance by not sending anybody. Uh, but whether they send people or not, actually, I do think that they still do send a very strong message uh, to Colombo by not sending Stephen Harper, because this is the heads of government meeting, and if you don't send a head of government, that is highly significant. So I think... Um, you know, we think that, that, um, that, that there's different ways to send a message. You can send a message by going, but you can send a much more powerful message by not going. Uh, and so we do not think they should send uh, anybody. But um, I think that, in a way, that just, just Tarpon's statements thus far have already sent a very powerful message. And, uh, and Todd, I'd love to hear your organization and even your views on, on uh, Canada sending a delegation and also the stance that uh, Prime Minister Harper has taken. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think Chuck, uh, who's also one of our directors, mentioned in his clip that uh, there, there is a concern that if no one attends, uh, that, that the voices of others could have a, a more resonance at the meeting. Uh, my understanding is the government is planning to ascend a delegation. Uh, however, how high profile that delegation will be, whether that'll be Minister Baird uh, representing the Prime Minister or whether they'll send somebody even, uh, uh, you know, maybe a, a bureaucrat or something to represent. Um, but to, to the feeling is that they will send a person or a delegation uh, just to represent Canada's views. But again, it, it, does it does send a very strong message that the Prime Minister is not in the room. Uh, and that uh, and everyone knows the reason why he's not in the room uh, as as an organization CHRV um, We're very pleased that the Prime Minister has taken this stance and and has maintained this stance that he will not uh, that he will not attend uh, Minister Baird has also uh, has has been on record repeatedly 
uh, internationally that that Canada will not, uh, the Prime Minister will not be attending. And it's good to have the, the support of our, of our opposition parties uh, here in Canada as well, also saying, yes, this is the right thing to do. Canada should not have our head of state there. Uh, and the meeting should be moved. That's, you know, the, the, ult the ultimate goal would be that the meeting is moved away from Sri Lanka. Uh, and, uh, and, and hopefully that will come by November that, that we'll see this happen. Uh, and then, you know, it, it would be great if our Prime Minister could attend the Commonwealth meeting, but not in Sri Lanka. Well, this is, uh, this is certainly interesting. I think we should actually then perhaps talk about um, what, uh, Fred, perhaps I can get your opinion on what David Cameron is doing, because I know that, that opposition parties there have, uh, have been trying to convince him to do the same. Indeed, um, and not just opposition parties, but a whole slew of uh, really prominent uh, politicians, past, present and future, members of civil society, well-respected academics, um, advocacy groups, um, and, and uh, you know, even uh, people from within Sri Lanka have been saying that David Cameron shouldn't attend. Uh, he has said um, that it's too early to say. Um, and what that means to me, I think, is that they're genuinely discussing not attending. And I think um, that that, in a way, is, is, you know, it's very, very significant that this is not a, a done deal by, by any means. And um, I think it only takes one or two countries to say that they're not going to go. And you really do have a really difficult political scandal on your hands. So if David Cameron were to follow the lead of Stephen Harper, I really think that could be the death now to the you know, already uh, struggling idea that, that Holton Commonwealth Summit in Colombo in 2013 is feasible. Um, now, um, Alistair Birch, who is the Foreign Secretary of Responsibility uh, for Sri Lanka, he's an undersecretary, uh, went to Sri Lanka, uh, made some really fairly middling speeches in Sri Lanka, but um, basically uh, reiterated that the Prime Minister was on the fence uh, on this issue. So we're waiting to see which way he jumps, and obviously we and those other people are encouraging him to jump down on the right side of the fence and take the principal position that he should not attend, uh, that he should not give uh, the President of Sri Lanka this great PR coup. Uh, and, that, and that he should stay away. Um, and, uh, but uh, in terms of what they're saying publicly, uh, they're playing for time. And we, they, they say it's too early to say, but they absolutely refuse to be drawn on when they will make a decision or what criteria they make a decision based upon. Now, my, my, my guess is they'll probably make a decision around June, July, uh, and that this will be based upon, to a certain extent, how bad the human rights situation is in Sri Lanka, but also the sort of global political situation. Frankly, if they think they can get away with going or not. Um, so, so, you know, we, we, we're pushing David Cameron hard to make that decision, and we're all waiting with Lady breath to see, uh, to see what he does. So, Todd, let me put this question to you. I mean, what is the likelihood that this, um, that this, that a change of, I mean, are we looking for, does it seem like um, organizations such as yours are just pushing for a boycott, or is, are we talking a, um, a change of location? And, and which of these are actually possible? So I, I think it's very possible to see a change of location still. And, and the Isn't this late in the game, really? Yes, okay. yes. And, and the ultimate goal, I believe, would be to have the change of location. Because oh. as we said earlier in the show, it's not just the, the physical location of this meeting, but it's Sri Lanka becoming the chair of the group for two years. Uh, and so, that happens automatically once they hold a meeting. Right. right? Yeah. Okay. So if... Um, you know, if we were able to change change the location of this meeting, that uh, that the secretary general makes this move, and I believe Fred is Fred is right that uh, you know if if um, if the if the prime minister of Great Britain were to come out and say I'm not attending either, there would be incredible impression uh, pressure on the uh, on the Commonwealth to change the location. Uh, I, it is it is hopeful. I mean, the relationship between Prime Minister Stephen Harper and the British Prime Minister is very strong. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're hoping that that our Prime Minister may have some influence over uh, over um, the British Prime Minister as well on on uh, stepping forward and saying no, I will not attend. And by him saying no, I will not attend. I think that will have the end result of them changing the location. Now, I, I we might not. Uh, finish this question, but at least I'll, I'll start it out and then we can always take it into the next segment. Um, I'm trying to figure out what kind of an effect, 
I mean, this is going to take a tremendous amount of work by organizations um, like yours. So, Todd, I'm curious, what kind of an effect do you think um, a move of that kind can have on the government of Sri Lanka? They've been actually pretty good at sort of ignoring things that have happened inter internationally, from movies to books to UNHRC resolutions and kind of navigating their way past those. So what do you think that effect would be? Like, what makes all of this advocacy worth the work? Well, I, I think we should, we should go back and remember why, we're, why we are working towards having the meeting moved away. And that is because, um, uh, because of the war in Sri Lanka, because the uh, tens of thousands of people who died, uh, particularly in the, in the final days, uh, and, and the lack of, uh, of response from the government of Sri Lanka to, uh, to hold a, a valid inquiry or to, to go through a process of reconciliation. So we have to remember the individuals who were impacted by this. We have to remember the individuals who are still in Sri Lanka who, uh, who do not have the freedoms, were not openly allowed to go to, uh, uh, to grieve their loved ones. Uh, who still live in fear or, or still have not uh, been able to, to get back into uh, a, normal, uh, a normal life, whose human rights are still being abused. So I just want to put that out there, that this is why it's important that the Commonwealth not, uh, not sort of give this stamp of approval to Sri Lanka by holding uh, the heads of state uh, meeting there. Um, if, uh, if, if it goes ahead, what essentially the world community is saying is that we've moved on, uh, that, uh, uh, that Sri Lanka has won, that the, uh, the government has, um, in our opinion, they've done enough to, uh, to address the concerns and, and we're moving on to the next page. And I think that that's part of the atrocity here, that, that as an international community that we're not remembering uh, all of those lives that were lost, and we're not remembering the war crimes that uh, that were committed. Um, that really, that is the challenge that that I put out to the world leaders: is Are you going to stand beside a country that has had these human rights abuses and that has not done anything to uh, to have a reconciliation process, or done very little to have a reconciliation process? Are you willing to stand beside them and say now that everything is okay? Interesting. Well, we're going to take a, a break from that, that and come back and perhaps we'll get a chance to put the same question to Fred. So we're going to take a break now. You're watching Crossroads on TVI with Manjula Savaraja. <music> Welcome back to Crossroads on TVI. We're speaking about the Commonwealth Heads of Government meetings scheduled to take place in Sri Lanka this fall. I have the pleasure of speaking to Todd Ross of Canadian Human Rights Voice. He's with us in the studio today. And on the phone, we have, and on Skype, we have uh, Fred Carver, who um, is with the Sri Lanka Campaign for Peace and Justice. So before we go to them, I'd like you to take a look at this clip of our interview with Dr. Peter Silverman. He's a renowned Canadian journalist, a recipient of the Order of Ontario, and a CHRV uh, director. Here it is. The trouble is with civil wars is that they generally end up with a vengeance mode. In other words, the winners want to re get redress for everything they think that these other people have done by creating a situation of civil war, the brutality, because civil wars are brutal by any definition. So there's a number of things coming in, but I just want to stress the other thing. You've got 2.3 million people there. What's going to happen to them? And as I said before, nobody's going to open up their borders and say, we'll take 2.3 million Tamils. A certain number can, can get out if they can. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, there has to be the mobilization of world opinion to force the central government in Colombo to turn around and say, no, the policy we're pursuing is wrong. We could end up 50 years from now, 25 years from now, from now another war, another civil war, in which case the next generation of Indian Tamils in South India might participate. So it has a ramifications that go just beyond the island. 
Now our viewers will be glad to know that this is actually going to feed really well what Dr. Silverman just said to a show that we will be doing in about two weeks about asylum seekers because that is an, another pressing issue that advocacy organizations are concerned about. But Fred, I'll, I'll you know, I, I know I'm going to get this question from people calling in after or emailing us. Can you tell us a little bit about your organization because you do some fabulous work out there uh, with regards to activism in this area? Well, thank you very much. You're so kind. Um, I mean, our organization was founded basically because of um, that fear which was manifested in that trip you just, uh, you just played. But um, the way things are going in Sri Lanka, um, we're heading back towards civil war. And the Tamil Tigers were so utterly defeated that we're not heading back towards civil war tomorrow or the week up next. But the way things are going, the total absence of anything that resembles a reconciliation process in Sri Lanka, we're heading back towards war. And there's some really, really angry young people in Sri Lanka, and they have a right to be angry. They, their rights have been trampled upon. Uh, but that, that's really not a healthy mix, uh, the sort of, you know, constant, um, you know, underlying effects of war not being addressed, compiled with angry and grieving young people who aren't being allowed to grieve or express themselves politically. Um, and so the Sri Lanka Campaign for Peace and Justice was uh, an attempt uh, set up in 2009 uh, to create a sort of multi-ethnic and non-partisan uh, sort of cross-group uh, uh, platform to campaign on Sri Lanka, um, very similar to other campaigns. Uh, similar campaigns that ran previously on Burma and other countries. Um, and if you go to our website, which is www.shrankacampaign.org, you'll have some idea of what we do. What we do is we try and explain what's happened in Sri Lanka um, to an audience who might not be familiar with it. So if you know nothing about Sri Lanka, I hope you'll still find our website interesting. Uh, we give advice to tourists to Sri Lanka about how to go to Sri Lanka ethically and also the ethical conundrums. We address the question of whether you should go to Sri Lanka at all and if you do go, how you should go. Uh, we're running campaigns. We have a Take Action page where you'll see all the petitions that we're running, which we find to be a very good tool uh, to sort of harness grassroots support around the world, which is one of the things we see as our strength, and apply it to international bodies to, uh, to take action against the government of Sri Lanka and bring the government of Sri Lanka back towards a more even keel. And finally, you'll also see um, a, a donate page up there, and we are a completely volunteer-funded organization, and we really do just re rely on individuals, people who, who, who've heard about us and like us giving $10, $5. Uh, we actually bank in the UK, so we use pounds, but you can pay in dollars uh, to <laughs> keep us afloat. Um, and um, I think, as I previously mentioned, we've uh, just run a series of infographics, which are all up on our website if you have a look. And it's sort of, if you know nothing about the situation in Sri Lanka, or you know, as I'm sure many of your viewers, you know a lot about the situation in Sri Lanka, but you have friends who know nothing about it and you want to tell them what's going on in Sri Lanka, send them those infographics. And I think that's quite a good introduction to the topic. And then hopefully they'll, they'll then ask you a, a whole bunch of questions which you can, you can refer back to us. So if I understand again, Fred, if, if someone wishes to donate to you, they can find that information on that website that you provided, right? Yeah, click the, click the donate button, uh, which is in the top right-hand corner. Uh, if you're in Canada, you won't be able to set up a bank subscription, but you will be able to make one-off donations. It's very easy. All the information is on there. Wonderful. And then I'll put the same question to you, Todd. Um, you know, why was the organization started? And, and you know, how can people get involved if they, if they wish to, if they find this compelling and wish to help? Mm -hmm. So the Canadian Human Rights Voice, uh, we were founded in 2009 uh, while, while the war was happening in Sri Lanka. And out of frustration that uh, here in Canada and, and I think similar experience around the world, that people were very much focused on what was happening domestically. Uh, that we had thousands of people out on the streets protesting, uh, saying, pay attention to Sri Lanka, and our local media here was responding by saying, they're blocking the road. And that was the message that was coming out of it. So we formed uh, uh, to, to create a human rights group that would provide information on what was happening in Sri Lanka. Uh, we have focused largely on, uh, on educating politicians mm -hmm. uh, and, and people who are politically involved. And every year we do a number of events that, uh, that uh, will bring in politicians to speak to the issue. 
we we know that you know obviously the minister and the and the prime minister's office are well versed on these issues we're trying to reach out more and more to those backbench MPs and you know whether they be from uh, from Alberta or, or Nova Scotia uh, so that there's more of a knowledge around the country uh, from our from our political people on on what's happening we also have a website uh, chrv.ca uh, where um, where we provide information on on uh, what's happening in Sri Lanka as well as other human rights issues around the world, uh, and uh, we have a number of clips from from our from our past uh, past sessions with various MPs and whatnot speaking on uh, on human rights abuses uh, as, mostly in Sri Lanka. Um, I believe you can also donate through our website, mm -hmm. and and we are also a volunteer. Uh, uh, all of our funds come from from volunteers and and uh, twisting arms, asking people to donate to us so that we can do yet another event or send out yet another press release. Uh, you need money to do things. I mean, it's abs yeah. Absolutely. Most of the folks that come in here from you know charitable organizations, NGOs, tell us, and they do great work. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and part of it is that that um, although we focus on what's happening in Sri Lanka, uh, I. I Think you can tell I'm not from Sri Lanka. Uh, we try and reach out to to a broader community as well, so that uh, it's not just people from from Sri Lanka who are involved. You saw Chuck Conkle, you saw Peter Silverman, uh, who we've we've been trying to engage more and more people uh, from outside the the Tamil community to say uh, this is what's happened. We as as Canadians have a responsibility to react uh, and to to put that message out to, to a broader society. Well, what's interesting is at that uh, forum, which we've seen clips of that, that uh, TVI Crossroads was at to, to do some interviews, I talked to Patrick Brown, uh, uh, he's a MP of Barrie, right. a member of parliament for Barrie, and what was interesting was that he even said, he goes, I have five Tamils, not 5,000, not 500, just five in his riding, but regardless, the, the aspect, the human rights aspect is very, is important to him. He's a lawyer, he's done, I think, work in that area before. And I thought, well, that's exactly the kind of uh, person I, I think that you hope to target and, and sort of inform. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, and, and at the beginning of the show, I mentioned, you know, we, as a society, we do have more and more things going on around us. We have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have television shows, our, our commercials are, are based on 20 second clips. Uh, so our attention span is not that great nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's really, it's reminding people what's happening because there are so many things happening around the world uh, and it's keeping a focus on specifically what happened in Sri Lanka and what continues to happen in Sri Lanka. So it's trying to get people to remember uh, that you may have seen a clip on this, you may have seen the Killing Fields, uh, that, that amazing Channel 4 documentary. Um, so just to, to remind people that this is still happening, it's still an issue, and that you can have an effect by contacting your Member of Parliament. Uh, you can send an email or a, or a letter or, or phone your Member of Parliament's office and say, I agree the Prime Minister should not be attending. Um, and, and you can become sort of more politically active. And that's one of the things that we try to do uh, every once in a while. We have a session where we try and teach people how you can become more involved. Uh, and those simple things, Patrick Brown was telling us that those five constituents, a couple of them came into his office to tell him about their personal situation, about what was happening to their family and their friends in Sri Lanka. And it was because of that that he got involved. So, I mean, that is such a simple act just to call up your member of parliament. And share your own story. Or your share friend, your yeah. concerns, your story. Uh, and for, for Patrick's case, I mean, Patrick's a, batch, a backbench conservative MP who has been an advocate for the last four years. He's attended just about every one of our conferences and spoke. Uh, and again, like there's no, there's no political draw for him. He's not going to win his election based on these five votes, but it is a concern for him. So, I mean, if more and more people are able to do that, then that creates sort of that groundswell in Parliament that they want to support the Tamil community. Wonderful. Well put. Fine words to end the show by. Thank you both uh, for joining us today. Pleasure. Such a pleasure. Thank you, Fred. Thank you very much. You've been watching Crossroads on TVI with Manjula Salvaraja. It's been a pleasure. And as I said, our next show uh, coming up in a couple of weeks will be further to this about asylum seekers. Thank you and have a great day.
Fred <laughs> Seven Eagle Tamil Indian Bob, Uncle TV.